hopefully this works now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session, which is uh, on behalf of the Dynamic Coalition on DNS Issues, the, re the recently revived Dynamic Coalition, I should say, and it's great to see so many of you in the room and online. Um, today, we're going to be um, discussing uh, closing governance gaps, new paradigms for a safer DNS. We've got um, a wonderfully expert panel, both here in the room and online, who I'll introduce in the moment. But we also have many experts in the room, and also I th I'm assuming online. Um, because we've got so many speakers, um, we're going to try and just move quite rapidly through questions, but also we're really keen to hear from you. So uh, if, there's, if there's something that you want to intervene on, a question that you want to ask, uh, a challenge that you want to pose either to the panel or to us just generally, that's the point. Um, and if we have time at the end, we can maybe talk a little bit more about the Dynamic Coalition and what it does next and how it organizes itself. But we have got an incredibly substantive uh, load of issues to discuss. Uh, but luckily, we have um, wonderful experts to help us um, on the way. Um, so we are talking about governance gaps and a safer DNS. There's always been a a traditional sort of separation, if you like, between the more structural layers of the internet and content issues and, and both regulators and industry and the, um, the, the multi-stakeholder bodies such as ICANN and the CCTLDs, the country codes or the regional top level domains. They've understood these, these, these lines. But when we're thinking about harmful content, sometimes the lines become blurred and what this reveals is gaps in the way that we're governing this. So, so what we're hoping to get to today is an exploration of, of what those gaps are, but also try to be quite action orientated, like so what? What are we gonna do about it? What does good look like? And what do the different stakeholders need to do? Um, so um, joining us on the panel today, we have Keith Drazek, who is the Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at Verisign. Thank you, Keith. Uh, we also have, um, uh, to my right, your left, Esteva Sands, who is the Head of Sector at inter of Internet Governance and Multi-Stakeholder Dialogue at the European Commission. Just a little bit further on, we have Jia Rong Lo, uh, Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement and Managing Director for Asia Pacific at ICANN. We have, to my left, we have uh, Jennifer Chung, who is Director of Corporate Knowledge at Dot Asia. Somewhere, maybe in the building, maybe joining us later, Jean-Jacques Sayel from Google. Um, we'll look forward to his arrival. And online, we have uh, Fiona Al Alexander. I'm, I'm not sure if she's connected yet, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Uh, distinguished Policy Strategist and Fellow at uh, the Internet Governance Lab at American University. And also joining online is Rocia de la Fuente, uh, who's the general manager at LAC TLD. Um, so you can see that we have a range of experts from across the globe. Uh, a warm welcome to uh, particularly Rocia and, uh, and Fiona for joining online. So can I start with you, Keith? Uh, could you just give us a very rapid thumbnail sketch about what we're talking about? You know, why are we talking about governance gaps? I mean, we thought that we understood all of this stuff was separate. So what are the gaps and why does it matter? And how do we create that safer DNS paradigm? Very good. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Keith Drazik. Um, so I will get into exactly that, but I would like just to take a moment to uh, thank Emily and her team at the DNS Research Federation uh, and uh, my colleague Nick Smith who uh, were instrumental in getting the Dynamic Coalition on DNS issues back up and running. Um, it was as first established approximately you know, five or six years ago. Uh, it was focused uh, primarily on universal acceptance issues and its uh, origin. Um, and then it sort of during the pandemic phase went dormant um, and we have now uh, recognized that this is a, a, a critical, um, you know, convening opportunity to talk about these issues. So we're very excited about the reestablishment of the, um, the DCDNSI and uh, let's get right into it. 
So, um, Emily, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I think the key point here is that it's really important for those of us uh, in this space, uh, whether we are operators uh, or folks who have a concern about uh, you know, DNS issues, security, uh, online harms, broadly speaking, to recognize that there are roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of various actors. And whether that's uh, a registrar, a registry, uh, a hosting provider, CDN, or ISP, uh, when it comes to mitigating online harms, uh, it, we each have our roles, responsibilities, and capabilities. Um, and as we talk about those roles, responsibilities, and capabilities, it's, it's really important to recognize that in some cases there are gover go governance regimes or governance uh, in place. Uh, for example, in the ICANN community, as it relates to GTLDs, we have governance by contract. Uh, that with, there, is, there are obligations that registries and registrars have in the GTLD space, and there is a compliance function that is performed by ICANN. Uh, that's one example of a governance structure. Uh, CCTLDs, uh, as you know, as, as a distinct approach, typically have uh, relationships with local government uh, or local internet communities, where there is a sort of government governance umbrella. There, um, if we look at hosting companies and providers, uh, again, it's a, perhaps not exactly the same. We all, as operators, are subject to uh, the laws of our jurisdiction, uh, regulations. Uh, in some cases, best practices for our industry. Um, but we have, I think, what we've identified is a range of governance approaches. Uh, and uh, what, we're, what we've identified is that there are certain variability or ver certain variation in, in approach. At the end of the day, um, I view this conversation as the beginning of an opportunity for better communication, collaboration, uh, and uh, good work across the various parts of the DNS ecosystem, uh, up and down the stack. I think there's a need for us as technical operators, again, registrars, registries, hosting providers, CDNs, and ISPs, to work better together, to communicate and collaborate better together as an industry, as a sector, uh, so we can actually mitigate online harms in a proactive way, uh, in a way that actually um, uh, helps to reduce cost, reduce expense, become more proactive in our communication to identify bad actors and trends, uh, and, and at the same time to demonstrate that as an industry, as a sector, we have identified these challenges and we are committed broadly and collectively to, to do better work together to demonstrate to regulators that we are taking the initiative and that we are together identifying ways to work more collaboratively. Uh, because if we don't, we're going to be regulated and we will be regulated in a fragmented way uh, when, it, when it comes to different jurisdictions. So fundamentally, that is th the reason, I think, you know, one of the reasons we have this conversation. Um, I should also note that in addition, there are conversations we wanna have about the advent of blockchain, of alternate identifiers, alternate technologies, and that there are g potentially governance gaps in that area as well. So Emily, I'm just gonna stop there. I'm happy to weigh in as we go along on other conversations, but um, that's sort of, I think, the framing of the issue is we as industry have an opportunity to do better together. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to work in a multi-stakeholder fashion to make sure that we take on the views as industry of civil society, of government, um, you know, of the technical community um, to make sure that we are um, making you know, positive steps forward. So I'll stop Thank there, you. thanks. That's a really useful um, opening to us. So if I'm understanding you correctly, Keith, what you're saying, it, it, it isn't that people aren't doing anything. What it is is that um, people that, that is almost like unjoined up islands of activities, uh, perhaps a lack of communication, perhaps a lack of understanding of each other's good practices that could be improved. And so your call to action is for us to, to, to collectively step up. Can I just welcome Jean-Jacques Sayel with the relief that <laughs> you're here? Thank you for finding the room. Georgia, could I ask you and Jean-Jacques to, um, to just... Uh, 
swap positions or, or for you to to move onto the front row. Apologies for doing for so that um, Jean Jacques can can join up at the table. And while you're taking your seat, thank you very much, Georgia. And that's Georgia, uh, everybody who's um, co-organised the session with uh, Carolina and with Nick. So thank you very much for that. Um, Jean Jacques, I'm going to let you settle down um, in in position, uh, but. First of all, what I'd like to do, Keith mentioned, um, I'd like to call to you to, uh, to Jia Rong Lo as VP um, of um, um, VP of Stakeholder Engagement and Managing Director for the Asia Pacific to ICANN, because there's been a lot of activity within the ICANN environment, hasn't there? And to, you know, to respond to Keith's point about people needing to step up and voluntary practices. Perhaps you could just update everybody or of those who don't know already about what's been going on on the contracts. And then I'd, I'd like to give um, Esteva a bit of a spot and um, uh, Fiona as well. So coming to you next. So uh, Giron. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so within the ICANN community, uh, for those who don't know, ICANN is governed by a multi-stakeholder model structure. So anyone interested can participate in ICANN. And tied to um, the one particular conversation that's been happening over the past few years has been the topic of DNS abuse. And when this was first raised by different stakeholder groups, including governments, but it also included uh, civil society and the end user community. In fact, the at-large community who represents the end users, they were very um, for lack of a better way of saying it, very adamant that the issue of DNS abuse needs to be addressed within ICANN before we talk about having the next round of generic top-level domains. And uh, this conversation, when it first started, sounded very messy. Even, uh, for example, what's the definition of DNS abuse? People couldn't agree on the definition at the time. But fast forward a few years later, where we are now, uh, just on 9th October, uh, the ICANN accredited registrars and registries uh, will be voting over a 60-day period to amend the registration, uh, the registrar accreditation agreement and the registry agreements to update it to incorporate DNS abuse. And sometimes it's, it's you know, talking about models. Uh, when you look at it from an outsider perspective, you may think, Nothing seems to be moving, right? The conversations take very long. But if you look at it between milestones, actually we've come a long way. And you know, the, the agreement, the, the contracts that Keith mentioned, the ICANN has with registries and registrars will be updated. It will include clauses that defines DNS abuse more clearly, and um, which is uh, malware, botnets, phishing, farming, and spam. Uh, these areas, the conversations take some time to come together, but we've come to a point where it's a significant milestone. Now, is this the, the silver bullet, the panacea to everything? I would say probably not, but it's uh, moving in the right direction. So, you know, that's the key thing for us to take away, is that how do we keep evolving and moving the conversation to be relevant, to be address the challenges of the day? and to continue to have faith in that multi-stakeholder conversation where different stakeholders come together, you address, you raise a problem, and then you can come to a solution. So I'd like to uh, leave that with everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really clear explanation, and, and uh, thank you for that. But um, Esteva, if I can come on to you, you know, from the perspective of a regulator in the European Commission, we've heard from Keith, you know, up, we've got to up our game or we'll get regulated. We've heard from uh, Jia Rong, you know, this people have got to keep faith with the multi-stakeholder uh, scenario. Uh, from where you're sitting, do you think the industry is doing enough? Do you think that we are doing enough to close those governance gaps and respond to the challenges? And, and maybe you can, uh, you know, just let us know what we've got in store in terms of regulation. <laughs> Start uh, a bit of silence and tension. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would work. help it's the really environment. 
I think um, we are regulators, but we are also uh, very active members of ICANN. So I'm a bit uncomfortable when you present us only as regulators threatening the community. I think you will be very happy, most of you will be very happy to know uh, that we don't have new uh, regulations in mind. Um, what we have in mind is really uh, supporting ICANN. Um, and I have to uh, say from the starters that I'm, I'm very pleased and I completely agree with the approach that uh, my colleague has just presented on this on these uh, contractual negotiations. We think this is really the moment of truth in, in the NS abuse, but also in you know, the ICANN model. It needs to deliver on this thing. Uh, and uh, we were very pleased to see uh, that the amendments go uh, indeed in the right direction. We are very hopeful uh, that the vote of those, uh, of those amendments is gonna be positive. We cannot think uh, otherwise, frankly. Um, we did express very openly within the GAC, and many GAC members agreed with us, that the, the amendments are not enough to, to be able to tackle even this um, more technical definition of the NS abuse, which of course we were very happy to accept uh, in the context uh, of ICANN. Uh, for example, um, well, the, um, the amendments are a bit general when it comes to um, uh, defining concrete measures on the NS abuse. They are more based on the kind of the objective. Uh, we know because we've regulated uh, many different markets that uh, sometimes this is a bit weak. Um, we have also uh, missed some elements that relate to the transparency of uh, contracted parties. We would like to see uh, indicators. We think that this is really a very good incentive for, for the registries and registrars to to, to really get their act together when it comes to dealing with the NS abuse. We have also missed um, elements that relate to kind of proactive measures. It's uh, they are very uh, regulations that uh, um, uh, the, the amendments are very much focused into um, um, uh, forcing or asking uh, contracted parties to react to requests when they have this actionable, actionable evidence, which by the way, is a complex concept in itself. Uh, but of course we know that uh, some proactivity as many registries and registrars are doing is extremely beneficial. We have the example of the TU in Europe that has this uh, artificial intelligence system that uh, you know runs uh, these classic uh, technical lists that resolvers also also have at their disposal and that then they apply a little bit of artificial intelligence to, to be a bit proactive and uh, unautomated. All this is not in those amendments. And it would have been very useful that this is all in these amendments. Uh, but I have to say that uh, you know, we've engaged very constructively with uh, the GAC community um, and we are hopeful uh, that these issues will be uh, resolved in, in further discussions within the ICANN system. Um, and uh, that's our conciliatory uh, pitch for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Did you notice the rumble in the room before you started speaking? But uh, this is a, a, a really useful overview. Thank you very much, Esteban. Thank you for joining the panel today. But the sort of the European Commission, as a member of the multi-stakeholder community, having a view and, and wanting to encourage those, um, those proactive measures and uh, we're very fortunate to have both Jen Chung uh, uh, here in person and also Rocia online. And maybe we can come to you both and in terms of those pr proactive measures and, the, and also from Rocia's point of view uh, in LAC-TLD, the, the difference between the country codes, and I can see some country code managers here in the room as well, um, the, who are not part of that ICANN circuit, you know, is there some governance gaps to be closed in terms of information sharing? But first, I'm going to turn to, um, to uh, Fiona Alexander, who many of us uh, remember from her, her long service um, with the US government at the NTIA. But um, Fiona, if you can hear me, I hope you can. Uh, you've just heard from Esteva about the, the perspective from a European member of the multi-stakeholder community who happens to also be a regulator as well. But the, yeah, okay. Um, you know, maybe you could, you could help us to understand, you know, we often think of governments as having one single point of view. 
uh, maybe less often these days, but there are also quite profound differences of approach, aren't there, between the US and the EU in terms of uh, thinking about this. Um, so maybe you could um, talk to, to that point and, and the general regulatory perspective and how that fits with the sort of differences between DNS and content um, in, an, in this international global internet that we have. Sure. Hi, Emily, and hello to everyone in, in Kyoto and, and around the world. Uh, good morning from Washington. It's about 4.30 now, maybe. <laughs> Thank you very today. much for getting up so early as well. I should have started with that. It's, it's okay. It's just part of being part of the uh, global internet governance community to do meetings at all times of the day and night, so uh, not uncommon. But anyway, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, congratulations for reinvigorating uh, the Dynamic Coalition. I think that's great. Uh, and one of the reasons I think it's good to have places like this to have conversations is because it's um, a little bit more neutral in terms of a convening platform, but it also it's kind of a safe space to talk about issues that can be complex and can be a little bit more challenging in, um, you know, even in the ICANN system, which is multi-stakeholder, but as Keith described, has that regulatory contracting uh, process. Uh, and then governments uh, to government, it can be a little bit more complex as well. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to see the group is uh, reinvigorated. Um, and, and the topic is an interesting one, and I think it sounds much more simple than it actually is. Uh, DNS abuse sounds pretty straightforward, um, but the problem is that DNS abuse can mean lots of different things to lots of different people, uh, depending on where you sit as a user in the system versus a provider in the system versus a government in the system trying to address what you perceive as harms. And again, um, perception of harms or, uh, or real harms can be very different country to country. There is no international agreement or uh, even sometimes agreement between like-minded countries, specifically what constitutes harm. And I think it's important, um, and that's why this sort of idea of having uh, a lot of different tools at your disposal to solve some of these challenges is a good idea. There has to be an appropriate balance of how you deal with these issues. Um, in, in some in some jurisdictions, perhaps you want a more proactive approach. In other jurisdictions, you want uh, an approach where there's a demonstrated proof of harm versus proactively going in and doing something. And this is important as you try to balance the uh, important issues of free expression and human rights with actually uh, addressing um, when there actually is harm done by, by particular things. So again, it's, it's challenge and this cross-jurisdictional challenge I think is one uh, that can be difficult to resolve. So um, I, I know, I, th I think I saw when the, everyone was coming into the room, I think I saw Bertrand coming in, always uh, easy to spot him as he walked in the room. And I think, uh, you know, the, the work of internet and jurisdiction and the domain group in that has done a lot to actually help uh, push the conversation forward. It's done a lot in the way that it's convened stakeholders in a neutral fashion to help define terms. And I think that actually has very much led to some of these contract amendments in ICANN that folks have already sp spoken to. So again, I think making sure that there's um, shared understanding of terms, that there's a shared understanding of some of the challenges that we look at uh, the proportionality of the response. When do you take an extreme measure versus a smaller measure and who's best positioned to do all that? I think those are all important things to consider in the system as we look at DNS abuse and how to address it. And, and as like Keith, who started this conversation by framing some of the voluntary commitments, personally, I'm a big fan of those. I think they're more effective. I think they can be more targeted. And I think they can be quicker to resolve some of those issues. Um, but again, when looking at voluntary action, it's really important to make sure there's transparency in those systems and there's due process in those systems as well. So maybe just to leave with that and let others go and, and go into the conversation. But I just want to kind of stress that it's not quite as simple as one might assume when you just say DNS abuse. Of course, we all know what it means, but actually it's it's, it's much more complicated than I think it, it, it seems many times. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, uh, Fiona. And you've highlighted not only that, you know, that the, the issues are more difficult than they seem, but also that um, that there are important checks and balances to maintain. You know, there's free expression, there's human rights. And although we could probably, if we all thought about it quickly, we'd go, well, we don't want any DNS abuse, but we also want a thriving domain name system uh, in which people who can lawfully go about their business without uh, interference. But Fiona mentioned a really important aspect, which is the power of, of voluntary action and particularly 
when you have organisations like ICANN with that international reach, you can much more efficiently get that international um, impact than you can through um, uh, through a, a sort of one by one different jurisdictions taking action. Although, of course, the European Union has been very entrepreneurial in its use of extraterritoriality in and gaining that. Uh, uh, that wasn't a joke, everyone. <laughs> but uh, it, but it, it ha that has been, uh, and we, we're seeing that in, in the, the upcoming legislation, and we will all experience what that's like with a, with a directive now, with the NIST 2 directive. But Jen, thank you for waiting, and I know with a huge panel, the, the benefits of it is that we get this global um, uh, uh, coverage, but of course it means it Thank you for waiting for, su for such a long time for the floor. But other speakers have talked about the power of proactive actions, but also perhaps you could reflect on how these issues look in different regional perspectives. And I'm going to come to Rocio next uh, before co finally coming to you, Jean-Jacques. Um, but, but perhaps you know, from the Dot Asia perspective, you are a GTLD, a newish GTLD. Um, but if you could maybe reflect on the contractual amendments and also those pre proactive measures from the regional perspective, that would be great. Thank you, Emily. Um, I guess Dot Asia can be considered as a middle child, not so much new. I think we're past our 10th birthday, so not that, not that new. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, still new, yes, that's correct, uh, compared to, to Keith next to me, of course, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think Jen meant you <laughs> dot com, oh, not no, you personally. Dot com. Everyone, no, please, just do for not the record, misunderstand this is being for transcribed, the record. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, thank you so much, Emily, for that. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on, you know, beyond our contractual obligations, which Jiarong already mentioned, and I'll leave Keith to talk about a little bit more how the contracted party house has done a lot of good work, a lot of voluntary work in, in actually trying to, to look at the gaps and fill the gaps in its industry best practices. For that dot Asia, we are looking more at uh, using the trusted notifier uh, uh, systems, and it's more of a closer collaboration with regional partners such as um, AP NIC, AP CERT, and specifically we signed an MOU for trusted notifi notifier system with TW NIC, and I think it's really important when I want to stress that collaboration with the different parts of the DNS ecosystem is extremely important for us to be able to establish a fast track anti-phishing mechanism where we have, you know, TWNIC on one side and .Asia on the other side, being able to periodic periodically share different risks, periodically identify the risks. And I think that part is something that is beyond our contractual obligations, but it's very much to do with how the DNS industry, specifically the registry operators, really come forward with uh, a good intentions to make the DNS more secure, to make the DNS more trusted, and to make the DNS something that other people can rely on. If you are looking more to the fact, you know, the different uh, um, you know, definitions that are floating around about DNS abuse, you can already see that there is a lot of uh, people saying, uh, you know, one person it means one thing, the other person it means something else. But for the contracted parties, it is quite uh, simply, you know, DNS abuse for contracted parties is malware, botnet, phishing, uh, spam. And it's, it's not um, too much that we really need to nail down, this must be the only thing we do. We are doing above and beyond. And with the trusted notifier frameworks, I think it's really important to understand also to include the certs. We are also looking at establishing with AP NIC and AP CERT uh, and SANOG, a South Asian CERT. Um, I think it's uh, very particular in our region where there's a lot of stopgap where you think perhaps the European uh, region has a more comprehensive approach to regulation and comprehensive approach to that. We don't really have that in the Asia Pacific region. And I think that puts onus on uh, operators like Dot Asia and other 
uh, I star organizations in, in Asia Pacific to step up to fill this gap. I think it's really important to be able to understand there is more work that is being done than is being advertised. And maybe it's an advertisement or maybe it's kind of a uh, socialization issue where I think on the one side, perhaps uh, different jurisdictions looking at regulations are thinking, hey, the DNS industry, you're not doing enough but maybe we need to also let them understand, here are the proactive approaches we're taking. Trusted no Notifier System is one of the proactive approaches we're taking, and it seems to be working. And I think there are other um, initiatives that the Contract Party House, uh, both the registries and the registrars, are looking into that would be able to fill these governance gaps. Mm -hmm. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Jen. And uh, that's a really interesting perspective on the contract being a baseline and not preventing registries or registrars from doing more if they want to. I mean, from, from what we're hearing from the industry, it sounds like everything's great, <laughs> uh, but the, the session title is you know, about bridging governance gaps. It acknowledges that we're not there yet. Um, the, the, a perspective that we, we want to now include is that of the country code top level domains for those who are not aware of how it all works, and I know uh, that many in the room are very aware, uh, the country codes are not uh, bound by the policy determinations or the, the uh, consensus policies formulated in the ICANN community and do their own thing. And the country codes also have regional organizations like LAC-TLD in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and we're very happy to have Rocio here joining us remotely. And, um, you know, Jen, we heard from about the proactive measures uh, taken by uh, the registries and registrars. Rocio, maybe you can um, help us to understand what the proactive measures are being taken by the country code community in the Latin American region and, and your activities there in an attempt to uh, bridge these uh, governance gaps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you also for inviting me to participate in this panel. So as, as you were mentioning, CTTLDs and like GTLDs are not subject to the policies developed within the ICANN processes, and their policies are based on local regulations that are often established in coordination with their local communities. And in terms of um, the governance gaps or governance issues that we have seen at the regional level are relating mainly with um, a lack of sometimes understanding among different types of authorities about the functioning of the internet, the DNS, and the role of different technical um, stakeholders. And we have also identified some um, certain interests in these issues in some private actors that are not involved in internet governance, but that have approached like TLD and other organizations in the technical community for help in addressing these issues. So this has um, led to an initiative that at first we call the Illegal Content Workshop. And this is um, a proactive approach or collaborative approach that consists of um, a training and awareness raising effort on um, the operation of the internet, its governance models, the actors that are involved in its technical operation, and among other topics. And this is um, something that was originally intended for judges, prosecutors, and law enforcement agents. And um, later on, we have uh, adapt adapted this type of training activities to other audiences uh, that have also approached the technical community organizations. And we believe that these, um, these kind of efforts and um, uh, capacity building sort of activities have been um, successful and we, they, have been, uh, they have operated as an initiative to close certain governance gaps and most importantly to build networks of cooperation or at least networks of contact between authorities and organizations involved in the operation of the internet. And we see a very positive impact when um, national authorities, regulators, um, judges, policymakers can have a regular dialogue 
with CCTLDs in each of their countries or with other types of technical operators. And um, also we have been able to involve in, in certain um, editions of these workshops uh, the private sector also to, to um, address issues related to illegal content in their platforms and services uh, besides the, um, the DNS threats or DNS abuse issues. So this is one of the uh, proactive approaches that we have um, that we have developed at the regional level in, col in collaboration with the technical communities um, organizations. But um, there are also a kind of unilateral efforts that uh, were promoted by CCTLDs specifically. So I can maybe uh, later on in the panel share some of these. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Rosie. And, and uh, the, the, you, you make an incredibly important point about the, the lack of understanding among some policymakers and judiciary and oth others that you are proactively training about the domain name system and how it works. And, and uh, perhaps that is a point for, for reflection for those of us in the room and uh, um, listening to this online about how, uh, you know, how have we managed this, this public, this gap in understanding. Um, we at the DNS Research Federation did some consumer research and we tested people's understanding of some basic terms and we found that um, a small minority, but a significant minority, thought DNS was a kingdom from Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and, um, and some people thought that it stood for the Devon Nudist Society as well. Um, unfortunately, it's not that fun. Uh, but but um, Jean-Jacques, uh, 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 sorry, first of all, Rosia, I hope we can come back to you for, the, for a bit more c detail on the, on the unilateral action taken by some of your members. Um, and also, I'm going to come out to the room uh, for your questions and comments, so get ready. And also, Georgia, please let me know if anybody's uh, raising their hand online. You're very welcome to, to join in this, um, in this uh, conversation. But Jean-Jacques, welcome back. Um, for those who don't know Jean-Jacques, he spent many years at ICANN as a vice president of something very important, and he is now <laughs> currently um, Asia-Pacific head of content policy and global head of telecommunications policy at Google. And it's, it's really wonderful to have you joining the panel because of your understanding of the DNS issues, but also your, your new role in terms of content. And it comes back to Keith's opening remarks that there are, there are really good and mature practices in content moderation and harmful uh, the reduction of harms, but perhaps not as much joining up as there could be between the content community and the DNS. Um, so it would be great to have, well, whatever you would like to say, but maybe some reflections on that as well. Um, thank you, Emily. It's so nice to be, to be here. Um, <laughs> you've just shattered my illusions about what a DNS is actually about <laughs> after all these years. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry I was late. I was on a, I was on a, I a panel which was dealing with data flows, and for some reason they had questions to Google about privacy. Um, <laughs> so I had to stay a bit behind. Mystifying. Yeah. Um, so I, I had. I, I'm going to shorten what I was going to say or, or tweak it a little bit, having heard everyone. Um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts, indeed, from the perspective of Google. And it's interesting when, you know, when I started all these years ago dealing with internet issues. Um, you know, I was in government dealing with the World Summit on Information Society, and we were talking about how the internet was young and how we shouldn't hinder it with regulation. And I still think that's probably true that we shouldn't hinder it with regulation, but the reality is that it's now no more a child, it's not even an adult, and the internet is an adult, albeit I hope still a young adult like dot com. Um, and Keith. <laughs> and with this, I think we've had a, an evolution of the perspective, especially from governments. I think we've had governments, as we know, that have wanted to regulate the internet from day one, pretty much. But uh, we've certainly seen a, a, a broadening of this belief by a number of governments around the world that they needed to um, frame the internet with a regulatory uh, construct around it, and increasingly so. I think that's the reality. and so. When, we, when I look at it from a Google perspective, uh, we're not trying not to be regulated. 
It's, this is a thing of the past. It's more about how you are regulated. And within that regulation, there's also space for self-regulation, by the way. Let me hasten to say that, uh, because I think that's very relevant to today. Um, at least that's my hope. So just a, a quick one on, on, on Google, right? So Google as an information company since 1998, we've got this lovely mission uh, since 25 years ago, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So in that, for us, there's this notion of useful, of relevance of the information to the users. So the company's never been too keen on having users exposed to bad information, bad content. And so over the years, we've developed a lot of experience in tackling harmful content, inappropriate content, and undes undesirable content. And we've done it on our own back. So we've got a set of policies and, and community guidelines that some of you might be aware of whereby we can take action against inappropriate behavior that we see across our platforms, right? So the basic one is to, 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 to you know, there's like about four or so approaches within our strategy to, to, to deal with harmful content. We detect bad content, usually because it's been flagged to us by users or by machines or by governments, and then we try to remove it. Uh, and that can be pursuant, as I said, to, to user flags, and depending on whether it corresponds to our own usage policies or whether it might be pursuant to a legal removal process, depending on the platform. But then it's not just that. It's, it shouldn't be just about uh, removal. It's also about trying to make sure that users are exposed to the right kind of information, making sure our search results bring up quality results uh, from authoritative sources. It's also about encouraging good creators that create quality content on platforms such as YouTube, for instance, and also to follow the money and try to demonetize as soon as we see content that's you know, being generated or misused by bad actors. And the final, final one is about collaborations, and perhaps that's helpful. We try, and we have tried for years, to partner with all sorts of researchers and others across the industry to understand the problems better, to come up with technical solutions, and to share those technical solutions. That's the kind of overall approach. But let me get a little bit to the core of the matter. Um, and my experience also having moved from Europe to Asia Pac uh, a few years ago, uh, generally when I look at uh, content regulation around the world, and certainly in this region, um, I think there's definitely an Im a trend for much increased regulation, if not over-regulation. And there is nothing stopping those regulations applying to all intermediaries. Right, it doesn't. It is. You see a few countries coming up with social media regulation that's quite specifically defined as social media actors. Not always very well defined, but defined. But vast majority is omnibus regulation that is about internet regulation, and that concerns all internet intermediaries. And it's it's there or it's coming, and it's from um, a, a range of countries, uh, certainly from across Asia Pac. And I think also we need to think about the evolution of regulation when, say, 10, 15 years ago, you could probably still say that quite a lot of countries in outside of those two regions were looking at what the US was doing, what the EU was doing, and sometimes they were copying. I think the picture is much more complex now, where you have some coming up with their own pretty brand new regulation, greenfield regulation, and others, I see a lot of those cherry picking. They just say, oh, mm. I'll take a little bit of that EU DSA, but only the bit that I really like, not the due process parts. Oh, I'll take that, <laughs> all the nasty parts of the dreadful UK online safety bill. Sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, you know, adding their own veneer. Um, and it's there. And we're talking about significant markets. We're not talking uh, about a, a few hundred thousands of people. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people that are going to be regulated uh, through this. And, uh, and the internet intermediary is coming. And that I, I sense, I think, to your point about um, education and, and collaboration, I don't think there's a lot of education. Um, I was going to mention a lot of the, the principles that we like to see when we hear about regulation. And I can mention them. It's all about flexibility, about balance, proportionality, outcomes based and all that. But there's a fifth, like we've got four of those. I could read them out. But anyway, there's a fifth one. If you want to know, I'll give you the rest. It's on our blogs. The fifth one to me is about engagement and collaboration. One thing that I feel as lacking, and it's not just in this region, it's frankly in all regions, it's engagements by governments with the multi-stakeholder community. I still, well, you know, it's one thing to have a public consultation that you push on a website, but as a policymaker and tentative would-be regulator, how many times have you heard those guys, come, oh, and, and people, 
regulators, policymakers coming to you as an internet intermediary or indeed a member of civil society to proactively seek input. I haven't had that much at all. And I think there's really a deficit in policymakers and regulators actually listening and wanting to listen to the views of the technical community, of industry, of civil society. And when we look at the, like, this is supposed to be, in, in the EU, we call it a better regulation directive. They're supposed to come out and seek proactively the views of stakeholders. I don't really see that happening a lot. So, okay, we could try to remind them to do that, and the IGF is a good forum to remind them, but that's probably just not gonna happen. We're probably gonna have, as an industry, to go out there. So just trying to finish off going back on the, the DNS as, as an industry. I don't want to be scaremongering because I think that's not it's not about that, but I do think regulation is upon us, has been upon us for a while. And I think there's been some really nice carve-outs here and there in some of the recent legislations where the core of the internet has been um, you know, set aside, so to speak. But even if the regulations don't touch internet intermediaries as such, there's existing other types of regulation where I'm hearing very similar suggestions about DNS level actions. Copyright, other parts of harmful content. In APAC, I'm sure, Jen, you're, you're familiar with all the scams and frauds that we have here. People are saying, oh yeah, we should take action at the DNS level. And they're not gonna not say, oh, they're registrars and registries, let's not touch them. They're gonna go through whoever can take the action. And even though some of us are raising the, the, the concerns of a collateral damage, massive collateral damage to the ecosystem, it gets scant uh, attention. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work for us to do. I like a lot what I've been hearing here about being proactive, I think it needs to be done. It, we need to show that as, a, as an industry, as an ecosystem, we're trying to do the right thing. I, I know people in this room and I know they've got no interest in having bad stuff on their platforms, same as us. Um, and we're doing, we're all working really hard. So sure, we need to demonstrate that, but it looks like we all need to also raise our voices more, educate as much as possible. And I like to think, you know, like I, I know Estev, for instance, you've been doing a lot of work on internet shutdowns, things like that. And I think if we yeah, can, okay. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't mean you shut down the internet, I mean the other way around. Uh, uh, but perhaps we can have also some of some governments that help us in doing this outreach on the positive side about having balanced regulation and, and making sure that we leave space for freedom of expression and not over-regulate things. Thank you very much. So um, we had a challenge there for, for regulators and um, uh, to, to actually talk to, um, to industry. Um, so Esteva, I'm very happy to give you the floor if you want to respond to that. I know Keith, you wanted to come in on that. Uh, do any of the other panel members want to sort of to join that? Um, uh, Fiona and uh, Rocio, if you can just uh, raise your hands, then uh, Georgia can let me know if you want to come in. Uh, shall I give you the floor very briefly, yeah. Esteva, and then uh, Keith, and then I'd like to open the floor to your questions and the questions online as well. So do raise your hand if you would like the mic. Just uh, thank you so much for all these uh, interventions, by the way. I was uh, listening very carefully. Um, just be, uh, very briefly, it's inevitable to move from this discussion about technical DNS abuse, content DNS abuse. This is, uh, you know, uh, we know well that this is a discussion that will go on uh, for, for some time. Um, I think that we've moved in different planes, uh, talked about content, uh, mm -hmm. talked about technical issues. It, it, there is still value in separating both, at least for certain sort of conversations. Uh, you know that the EU has a very clear approach uh, when it comes to regulating uh, platforms that relate to content. This is basically the Digital Services Act. We found after a lot of discussions with many uh, stakeholders um, an approach that we think really strikes the right balance uh, between the user's rights and fundamental rights and the need to do something. I think one of w the reason why we're here and we opened these contracts and we are discussing these things is that we finally agree that, uh, you know, there is DNS abuse and it's something significant and, and that's very positive in general. Um, but beyond that, I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, at the international level, and that's why I've called you sometimes, but uh, also why I coordinate very well with Ken that I see it's there. Uh, he's a bit angry at us uh, these days because uh, he did the heavy lifting on the organization of the 
digital, the um, declaration for the future of the internet day zero uh, session, but we co-organized it, but he did the heavy lifting, I have to admit it. But we have actually coordinated very well with the US uh, on that declaration. And that declaration is many things, uh, there are many principles, but there is one thing, one way of approaching that declaration which is very clear for us, which is a straitjacket. Here we are proposing globally a series of principles for states not to do certain things, not to regulate the internet in certain ways that we think are uh, absolutely harmful. Uh, and uh, you know, digital authoritarianism is, is really a thing. And perhaps the worst thing that has happened to the internet is that now we know that authoritarian countries are using it to control their population. That's, that's the reality. The internet is not, no longer, we cannot see the internet any longer as, uh, as something that brings uh, freedom or freedom of speech or democracy. It really depends on how states uh, treat it. And the declaration is precisely that. It's a way forward, a series of principles of how to do things, but also how not to do things, how not to regulate the internet uh, so that it doesn't end up consolidating uh, authoritarian tendencies. Thank you very much. So uh, I know Keith, you wanted to come back. Uh, Jean-Jacques, really, you, you, um, you got everything like riled up because everybody's like, I want the floor. Um, I've got Fiona um, waiting to, to join as well. Uh, Jia Rong, you want to? And I've got Mark as well in the audience. Does anybody else? Uh, oh, great. Okay, we're good. We're going to be fine now. So, um, uh, Keith, in your remarks, perhaps you can address Jean Jacques's point. You know, Jean Jacques's like, the governments never call, but actually, do, do the industry talk to each other? Yeah. Uh, well, Esteva called you straight away, but are industry talking to each other across sectors effectively enough? So thank you. So thanks very much, Emily. And um, yeah, so I'm going to touch on a few things. I'll try to be brief. Um, I think the answer is not sufficiently. Uh, mm. The direct answer to your question is industry, especially when we talk about up and down the stack or you know across the, the, the range of operators. I think, um, and that was one of the reasons we identified the governance gaps as a challenge here, is that there is an opportunity and a need, I think, for registries, registrars, hosting companies, CDNs, and ISPs to engage more constructively and more proactively together to collaborate, communicate, identify trends of bad actors, mitigation strategies. So I think that is a fundamental opportunity that we have as industry. But to be informed by the concerns of civil society, to be informed by the views of governments and regulators, um, and so just to go back to one of the things that Jean-Jacques said, uh, clearly regulation is here. There's no, there's no turning back that clock, right? And to Esteban's point, I think regulation can be appropriate and is appropriate in certain circumstances. I think that's quite clear. The fundamental issue that we have as industry is that it needs to be informed and educated regulation, legislation, regulation, whatever it may be. Um, it, it needs to have the benefit of the input of the industry, <laughs> informed also by civil society concerns, and I'm going to get to this in a moment, going back to what Jennifer said about trusted notifiers. Right? As we start talking about trusted notifiers as inputs to us as operators, requesting, in many cases, the use of the DNS to take down content or to moderate content that raises a lot of real concerns. But, and when we talk about roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of the actors in the ecosystem, a registry can do a certain set of actions, very, very limited. A registrar can do perhaps a slightly expanded set of actions, but very limited. And when you start talking about content, hosted content at a third level domain, uh, registries and registrars have one option, and that is to take the entire domain, the second level domain, out of the zone. Um, if, if it's a bit of offending content or harmful content on a third level name or on a website, uh, the hosting company has to be involved in that conversation about how to mitigate those harms, um, and, uh, you know, and on and on. So it's really important to understand the roles, responsibilities, and technical capabilities of the actors in the ecosystem. And fundamentally, when we talk about using the DNS or taking action at the DNS level to mitigate content-related harms, we have to start thinking about 
providence, like the closest actor, the closest operator, the closest provider to the harm should be the operator that takes the action. So provenance, proportionality, making sure that if you're taking action to mitigate online harm, especially content, that you are doing so in a proportionate way that doesn't negatively impact other parts of uh, the, the ecosystem or impact negatively, disproportionately users. Uh, transparency, right? We need to have transparency when it comes to using the DNS to mitigate content, mitigate online harms. Transparency, what actions were taken? What was the procedure and the process that was followed? Um, due process, right? It was there due process uh, for consideration of that action? And finally, recourse. Is there a process for recourse for the impacted party if you got it wrong? Right? I think these are all things that need to be discussed. And if we rely on a third party, a trusted flagger or a trusted notifier that's outside of the traditional court system, um, that raises all of these questions. And so I think the understanding of the procedures, processes, the authority that a so-called trusted flagger or trusted notifier might have, especially when you're talking content, raises these questions. And these need to be discussed by industry, but informed by concerns of civil society, informed by the views of regulators, and that's a conversation I think that we need to have. Mm -hmm. But I think we, as, as industry, really need to start having this conversation together uh, so we can then take that next step of bringing in the multi-stakeholder sort of inputs. So Emily, thank you. Thank you very much, and I think if you could find some a different word for transparency, you, you, you're you getting close to a sort of five Ps type of um, uh, <laughs> policy principles there that could be developed. Now I've got a, an ever-increasing list of people who want the floor. Um, I've got Fiona, Gia, Jen, I've got Mark, the gentleman at the front, I've got Andrew, who else wants to take the floor? Michele? Um, so uh, what I reckon is let's let's try and get through these remarks in the next quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, because I want to set aside time at the end before we close to do a sort of, so what are we going to do, right? How are we going to close these govern governance gaps? What actions, what commitments can we make to actually make things a bit better? So Fiona, thank you for waiting. Um, um, and then I'll come to you, Jia. Sure, and happy. I just wanted to respond to a few things I heard um, other uh, uh, panelists uh, speak to. So I think it's important to keep in mind that the space, the technology space, has always had regulation. I think back to the telegraph and the early days of that. So there's always been regulation in and around technology. I think the thing that's changed in the last 30, 35 years is how that regulation comes about. And that's because of sort of the proliferation of the internet and what it affords people to do. And this really is sort of the multi-stakeholder approach to actually engaging everyone in the process. Um, and I think that's the important way forward and the important path forward to solve some of these complex issues. Um, and at least from my perspective, governments putting out a public comment process and government putting out a notice of rules and asking for feedback is not a multi-stakeholder process. Yes, you're talking to people and yes, you're getting feedback, but that's not actually a multi-stakeholder process. So no matter how well-intentioned it is for a group of governments to get together and say the right things and say things that could be useful, you know, I'm often reminded by what one of my old bosses used to say to me all the time, how you do something can be equally as important as the what you do. And in this case, to solve these complex problems, it really is important that the conversations and the solution sets to get to Keith's roles and responsibilities point really happens in a multi-stakeholder fashion where everyone is in the room, everyone is listening, and everyone's learning from each other. That's the way to solve these problems. It's not for one stakeholder group, regardless of whether it's industry or governments or civil society, to sit separately. That doesn't solve the problem from my perspective. So I just wanted to respond to a couple of things that were said. Thank you, Fiona. And that comes back to um, some of the remarks you made earlier about the IGF being a really safe space in a way to experiment with ideas. You know, you don't have the pressure of somebody maybe changing a contract or regulating at the end of it. These are problems that are difficult. And, and you were saying that earlier. These are the, these sound simple, but they are actually difficult to solve. They, they span multiple sectors, multiple different actors, as, as you were saying. So Gia Rong, you wanted to, uh, to reflect on some of the things you've heard too. Thank you. Um, so I, I was kind of hoping to just zone off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, after hearing Esteva say something, got me to think about one thing. Because 
Junja was mentioning about you know regulation um, and um, that what he's hoping to hear is governments reaching out to get the inputs and thoughts. And as Deva talked about balanced approach to regulation. And got me thinking su suddenly, because I've not had interactions with uh, EU regulators directly, but I've been on the receiving end from law enforcement agencies. Because after the EU enacted the GDPR, the ICANN registration lookup system, uh, most of you in the room would know who is, we have to redact a lot of the information of EU citizens. And law enforcement agencies, including Interpol, Interpol has the office in Singapore. So they called me up, I was you know, just catching up with them, and they said, your system now is useless. I can't do any cybersecurity investigations anymore because I can't find the information I need. And um, I was then realized, I realized that the same colleagues on the EU, on the lawmaking, policy making side, did you consult with your own colleagues from the law enforcement agencies? Because they have ended up being the victims of this same regulation. The intention is, is good, you know, you want to protect the privacy of your citizens, but the flip side of it is the same government folks, you know, who have charge of um, fighting cybercrime can no longer use the tool. Uh, so it's actually very hard. It's more a reflection in the question because um, I think governments, you have a role and you, you need to do what you need to do to protect your citizens. And it's, it's difficult because even just talking to each other within your own government is difficult. And then it makes it even harder when you want to think of getting inputs from multi-stakeholders. So I, I, sometimes I, I think that it's, it's very difficult because there's no one answer. It's gonna continue to be a gap. Uh, but what I think would help is, you know, we really try to find more opportunities for us to have these conversations with one another. Um, I don't have an answer for it, but it's just a reflection. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and we, we did actually make it past the hour without mentioning GDPR, but I think <laughs> it is a really important aspect, you know, that, that, uh, and it, it, it reflects some of the, the remarks made by, by Fiona earlier, sort of a lot of regulation is well-intentioned, and Jean-Jacques, you, you, you talked about the evolution of rev regulation, like we can't regulate this stuff, now we are regulating it, and may maybe over-regulating at times. But each regulation has its impact, uh, has its winners and losers. And uh, I'd like to bring Jen and Rocio back into the conversation at this point, you know, you know, just general reflections. It could be on, on the availability of data, and it could also be, you know, uh, fulfilling uh, your promise earlier, Rocio, to, to, to think about what di individual members are doing in the LAC region to try to address some of these governance gaps. So, Jen. Thank you, Emily. Actually, I really wanted to give a, a, a live case study to what Keith mentioned earlier about the list of, it's not really the five Ps, you had other other um, initials in there, but giving a different flavor of you know what a, a registry operator does. Obviously, .asia is .asia, but um, we also manage uh, are and are the op uh, registry operator for .kids, and .kids is one of the very first GTLDs with a mechanism for restrictive content. And what um, Keith mentioned earlier with that chain is extremely important because most of the registry operators, of course, our baseline is our contractual obligations and what is within the eye can remit to deal with DNS abuse. But as Keith already mentioned, downstream, we have the hosting providers, DNS resolvers, all of that. And at every point, there could be abuse happening, whether it can be termed specifically as DNS abuse or pretty much bad things are happening on the internet, so all the way to content. And for dot .kids, when you're looking at it, and actually I'm gonna like look at <laughs> Jean-Jacques as well, we actually rely on the Google Safe Search API to look at these restrictive contents for specifically for this uh, GTLD because the first thing we need to do to look at it is to actually have a policy that listens to civil society, listens to experts, and in dot .kids case, of course, the child rights experts, the child um, digital online rights experts, that community. And then the second thing is the transparency part of it. At every single level, when you're dealing with this kind of content, we need to have the paper trail of 
where, what is this reporting coming from, how are we addressing it, and then downstream, how are the due process, of course, how would a registrant or, or actually the user who has um, reported this abuse, how would there be recourse if they don't agree with the actions that we take? And this is just a kind of a, a, a live kind of case study illustrating what Keith just mentioned. So that was pretty much what yeah, I wanted to add. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Rocio, uh, would you like to, to uh, reflect on some of the things you've heard? And then I'm going to come to you, Mark, uh, data scaled, uh, um, and then gentleman at the front, Andrew Campling, um, Michaeli. Thank you, Emily. And first, I wanted to to mention that unlike the EU, there are no regulations in the LAC vision that promote the harmonization of policies and practices among CCCLDs. And that's why we see many differences in the approaches that are adopted by the different CCCLDs in the region. Also, we, we saw that some preliminary studies recently in the ecosystem have, have shown that the percentage of abusive domains is significantly small in the CCLB community. But um, even though the, the percentage of abusive domains is, is small, there are some cases of um, proactive action that have, that have been promoted by CCTLEs. And in terms of, of data, the, uh, the CCTLD registration processes, in some cases in the region, have introduced data validation mechanisms for um, individuals and also legal entities. And one of these validation mechanisms is based on national tax identifiers. And while um, these processes of domain name registration and delegation might be slower or more bureaucratic in relation to other CTLDs or GTLDs, the data validation mechanisms and those specifically based on tax identifiers raise the, the barriers for, for users that are seeking to register a domain for um, criminal activities. Also, there are other cases that are related to, um, to tackle specifically illegal content. And we have the case of .co, um, which presents a, a specific approach to tackle these cases of extremely serious illegal content as CSAM in partnership with the judiciary and also with international organizations um, for the protection of, of children um, online. And in this case, there is a national hotline that has been inco incorporated, which also includes uh, mechanisms for reviewing reports in coordination with specialized um, civil society organizations and also a protocol for blocking certain URLs in certain cases. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. Uh, th thank you very much. I know there's there's so much more to say, but those yeah. are really vivid examples, like the, the cooperation between dot, .co and, uh, and other uh, organizations in, in relation to uh, child and sexual exploitation materials. So uh, thank you very much for highlighting those. And I'd like to come back to you if we have more time, but I have got a queue of people in the room who've been waiting very patiently for the floor. Um, Mark, can I start with you? Um, so there's a, a microphone in the middle. I hope you don't mind that. Maybe we can take those four um, comments from the floor and then come back to uh, the sort of the the need for action uh, to the panel so thank you very much mark thank you very much to everyone uh, this is mark datasgeld i'm an internet governance consultant and i was co-chair of the team on dns abuse that eventually made suggestions to the contractor parties that were then taken in by them and um, worked on within their their terms so um, one important question that came up, and Esteve mentioned it in passing, but I would like to really stress this, was that what our group did was seek the minimal level of technical abuse. And, and this is maybe a fault to of how where we arrived with this. It is DNS abuse, but we are thinking about the technical level because this is something that we could get um, together as a community and agree and I kept posing questions to people such as, you know, you know, cite me a good botnet, one. 
give me an example of a good botnet that's not like a novelty, like an academic experiment. There are none. So you have no reason basically not to take down botnet. So the suggestions we arrived at are the very, very floor, something that in theory, you know, if I was to say this shouldn't have been addressed before. We're just trying to get to the point that we need to be, the very basics, and from there, now it's a discussion of what are the things that are not the, the bottom of the bottom, right? That, that, that's the discussion that starts uh, once hopefully, and I'm not promising anything, but hopefully the, the contractor party parties adopt these amendments. Where do we go from here? Where are the next things? So with technical, it's not all technical, but there are still technical abuses out there, but the basic ones handled, where to move next. Yeah. So that should be our question, right? It's not where is DNS abuse at right now? Technical abuse is kind of slightly getting solved. Where do we go from here? Thank you. Thank you very much. So Mark is, is making the point about you know, the, the community starting with very technical uh, definitions. So let's let's hold on to that idea um, and invite uh, invite you, sir, to, to make your point. I'm sorry, uh, would you mind going up to the mic? We can try and get it to you otherwise. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce first so that uh, this is Ganesh. I work for the government of Nepal. Uh, before talking about uh, DNS governance related threats and challenges, we need to know about the capacity gap of the developing countries related to the governance gap. You know that we don't have CDPR, G GDPR, all the cyber security law, as well as other are related legal as well as infrastructure that that might be essential before going to address to the uh, DNS related threat. So how we can strengthen the collaboration as you mentioned already between not only the civil society and the private sector but for among the development partners as well as the experts. So that we can have, we can minimize the, uh, those gap. Always, although there is always the threats of the DNS related threats are there, so that we need to build the capacity of the uh, developing countries, particularly the, uh, where there is a lack of legal infrastructure uh, as well as the physical infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kanish, and uh, a really important point. Thank you for raising it, you know, that we can have a, a very global north conversation. We have to, uh, you know, one of the gaps, most important gaps to overcome is that capacity gap that, that you mentioned. So I hope the panel will reflect on that. Um, Andrew, I think you were next, and then Michele. Hi, thank you. Um, too often in sort of when we have gatherings like this, um, the conversation usually starts with, we can't do X, where X is something that the community doesn't like uh, because of fragmentation or because of the internet way of working or some other, in my view, generally quite flimsy uh, excuse. So I thought it was really incredibly positive that this whole discussion started with Keith. Yeah, uh, and, and then others talking about sort of pr preemptively, pr sort of proactively rather, preempting the need for regulation by actually doing positive things um, to, to, to deal with problems, recognizing that, uh, that there are problems. I think that was uh, sort of very positive. Um, and if only more in the community took um, th th that approach. Um, <coughs> thinking about the gap, so, um, and perhaps tossing in a, a different aspect. Um, are new standards as they relate to DNS, do, 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 do the panelists think that they might be introducing new gaps, mm. um, new challenges um, uh, from a governance perspective? And should these be considered in advance in much the same way that legislation should perhaps be more considered uh, uh, in, in advance? Um, and, and if so, how do we get more policy um, stakeholders engaged in the standards community, which is currently very undiverse, 
um, and not, in my experience, overly welcoming of uh, the multi-stakeholder approach. Yeah, thank you very much. So we're, we're actually getting uh, from the audience some really important additional gaps uh, that, that I'd like us to reflect on. And um, in addition to the sort of the limitations of technical-led uh, de definitions, we've got the gaps in capacity. And now from Andrew, the gaps in um, getting policy voices into emerging standards in the space. So not much for you all to deal with in your one minute of reflection that you'll be having. But we haven't heard from Michaela yet, so please uh, take the floor. Um, thanks, Emily. Uh, Michaela Nalen, for those of you who don't know me, um, so I'm the founder and CEO of a hosting provider and registrar based in Ireland. Um, a couple of things. I mean, first off, to the gentleman from the EC, would you please, please, please stop using .eu as examples of anything? They operate under contract with yourselves. So holding them up as the gold standard, while it might be suitable in certain, certain scenarios, expecting other registries and registrars to uh, automatically adopt whatever it, .eu is able to do is, is kind of pr is quite problematic. Um, I think a lot of what Keith was talking about makes a lot of sense, but the, one of the problems I'm having with this is, where's the line between DNS and internet? Because not everything is a DNS problem. It really isn't, and trying to solve it, I think as Keith rightly points out, a lot of the issues that need to be dealt with aren't within the scope, within scope for registrars or registries. We're not the best equipped to deal with them. We shouldn't be the ones to deal with them. I'd even go further and say that in many cases, as hosting providers, we're not even particularly well equipped to deal with them because there are issues on platforms and things like that which we really can't see. I cannot, if I was hosting facebook.com, for example, I could remove the entire website or a large part of it. I wouldn't be able to remove one offensive post. It's the same with any blog or anything like that that we might host in our network. We've no ability to block, to remove a single piece of content. It's very, very hard to do that. Um, the issue, though, really becomes one of, okay, who, you, who do you want to talk to and what's the problem you're actually trying to solve? Like at the moment, like in, in Europe, one of the issues we've been seeing is a huge rise in smishing. So smishing, it's like the, tel it's the telecoms companies that could do something, but have failed to act in many cases. And but right now, the only ones who are being able to are unable to take any action are going to be the registries and the registrars because it's a, it's a URL, so it's a domain. But why aren't the telcos being asked to do things? I mean, because just from our perspective, I think we're a little bit tired of being the ones that are the stopgap for everything. For all the evil on the internet, it comes back to the DNS, and in many respects, it actually doesn't. Thank you very much, Michele, and also it's great to have a, a, a voice from a registrar as well in the room. You don't see many registrars at the IGF, so thank you for, for raising that. And uh, um, I think there was a challenge to you, uh, Esteva, which we'll hopefully you'll respond to. But um, are there any further questions either online or in the audience that we want to get through? Yes, sir. And then I'm going to wrap the session with... Um, uh, my name is Werner Stab. I work for also a registrar. It's actually an organization that also does a registry system. It's core association. You know, it's a not-for-profit, you know, whose objective is to improve the DNS by uh, getting some resources in place by sharing resources um, for operating systems. And, uh, you know, the habits that we've gotten into over the last 20 years turn out to be now not so good habits because rely on things for the security of the DNS that have disappeared. When the DNS was created, fax numbers, telephone numbers, and physical addresses, postal addresses, used to have meaning at that time, 30 years ago. They don't have any more. They have become totally liquid, floating. We can have a telephone number anywhere. It doesn't mean anything. It's no longer a f an anchor. But more importantly, the domain itself has been a victim of its own success. Because there are so many domains, the cost of losing a domain is irrelevant for an attacker. 
he was still behaving as if it was a great problem for an attacker to lose their domain. Of course, they, they couldn't care less. You know, they've got thousands, millions of domains accessible to them, not necessarily under direct control, because there's a gray market of making domain names available you know, for all kinds of things, which then also enables them to use them selectively. And so it is no longer just a question of um, uh, handling uh, evidence of abuse. It's just too late by when, it's when, when it comes to there. And then when we actually act, you know, the attacker couldn't care less. Yeah, so I think that's, um, that's a good, a welcome reminder to all of us um, over a certain age that sometimes 20-year-old habits aren't always best for us. But in closing now, I, I said we'd get to it five minutes ago and half of my plan for the session has gone out the window. But um, one thing I would like to revive is this, this sort of future looking and, and to come back to your original call for action, Keith, is like, what can we do? You know, it's always easy to point the finger and say somebody else should do something. Um, I heard something that uh, I was reminded of a phrase earlier this week, uh, which is those who can should. And so there are people in this room and on this panel who have got some capacity to do things. So my, my question to you is, what can you do that will make things better? Jean-Jacques, we haven't heard from you for a bit, so I'm going to put you on the spot, and then I'm going to run through um, the, the panel. So just thinking uh, individually or for an organization? Both. But it would be better to hear from Google, honestly. Okay. <laughs> um, look, I, I mean, I think there are a few things that we're already doing and things we should discuss in more detail in terms of, and, and, and I think Keith has already given a few good ideas along this way. Um, maybe starting with uh, reference to what the gentleman from Nepal was saying in capacity building. Uh, I know we do quite a bit of capacity building on our, of our own, for instance, where we engage with certain governments and we explain how we deal with harmful content. We also do it through um, uh, third party organizations. So for instance, um, the UN Office of Drug and Drugs and Crime often organizes training sessions for law enforcement agencies from countries across Asia. Um, and I've, I've gone there myself to explain how internet companies deal with harmful content, terrorism, that sort of stuff. So there are some channels um, that exist and, and you know, we can talk about that. But then, you know, I'm mentioning UN agencies and it's great we're in a UN forum after all, so we have to give them a credit. Um, but then, uh, going back to what some of us have been saying in the room, you know, is there something that we can do as an ecosystem, right? Not just uh, internet industry writ large, but as an ecosystem. I mean, uh, it was interesting to hear Michele talk about, and he's gone, but uh, uh, to him talk about, you know, everybody turns to the DNS people for action, well, and, and, and saying all the ills are because of the DNS. I don't think that's entirely true, they turn to us as well. Uh, <laughs> Possibly um, a little more so sometimes. <laughs> maybe. Um, and um, anyway, um, I was just talking about some of the governments that talk to us about this information seriously. Uh, look in your own backyard. But anyway, um, I think there, there, there should be some discussion. Perhaps we, we should we should continue this discussion in a way to think: okay, what is it practically that we can do? Is there are there more coordinated actions that we can take? Um, you know, having worked for ICANN, and I, I, I know what I was trying to do in Europe when I was there, what I imagine Jarong is trying to do quite regularly is engage those governments, right? Trying to explain to judges, to law enforcement, how it all works. Importantly, and, and so I think we should continue the discussion, just think about very practical things to do. Perhaps it's just also a question of visibility, saying each other, you know, oh, there's that school on internet governance, for instance, that I can and others run. Can we tack on to that something for governments? And by the way, it doesn't have to be in person. We've got something called the internet. We can do GVCs, yeah. right? And we can get governments from Nepal, from Bhutan, from everywhere to join those trainings online and beef up their understanding and also network with the industry, get a lot more understanding. I think we can very practically do that. There's a bit of explaining and, and some basic explaining that we need to do, even with governments who are supposed to be informed. Like I'm looking at and Lisa, we've got work to do in Australia to explain to people that DNS level blocking is bad. Mm. Um, just as one example. Mm. Um, and so I think there's a lot more that we could continue to discuss, very practical mm. actions uh, of engaging with those governments. So I'd, I'd love to continue. I don't know what platform would be best. Mm. Uh, maybe Jarong's got some sort of ICANN SIG or something that we can Thank tap you. onto. Thank you very much. And um, 
I'm going to um, ask uh, Esteva next, and then I'll come to uh, to Rocio and Fiona, and then come to you, Giarong, and then Jen. And so, brisk remarks, four minutes in total. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to start acknowledging uh, the, the, the questions and comments from the from the audience. Uh, capacity building is key. We have to admit that this is a global north conversation. We, this we are we are global north discussing the NSWs uh, mostly, uh, and this it, this this is bad for the overall ecosystem, and it will play very badly in the WISIS plus twenty discussions that uh, will emerge very soon. We need to work on that. I know that ICANN is making. Uh, great efforts to uh, be more inclusive, uh, um, uh, working on, on uh, support in relation to the new round of, uh, round of, uh, of TLDs, uh, but we need to, to do more. Uh, I can just say that uh, we are uh, perfectly aware of this situation and we are um, engaging also in the context of the Declaration for the Future of the Internet in capacity building uh, uh, projects in, in the context of the Global Gateway, development support, etc. Uh, but this is this is probably one of the core fundamental problems of the of the model. Um, I think. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> to just to to get the others involved, but that, that's a really important point on the need for inclusive yeah. conversations involving the global south. Uh, Fiona Rocio, can I ask you for your uh, concluding uh, uh, thoughts on what action needs to be taken, preferably by EU? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start. I think um, one of the things that, I think that this session helps reiterate is the, the first thing that people need to do is get in a room and sit down, whether it's remote or in person, and have a conversation, right? So the only way you can solve problems is to sit down and talk to each other, understand the issue sets, figure out what the gaps are, as have been raised by folks in the audience. Uh, even Michaela's point about bringing in other actors um, and not just focusing on the DNS players. So. I think you know just what can happen and what should happen is a sustained way of having and continuing the conversation, whether it's at other IGFs, whether the dynamic coalition wants to have its own meetings, but I think continuing the conversation is the best way to get us to some shared solutions. Thank you, Rocio. So very briefly, as an organization from the LAG region, I believe that one of the tasks we want to undertake is to improve the mechanisms to measure and identify, identify levels of DNS abuse. We believe this is this will be very helpful for some CCTLEs in our region. And we also believe in the importance of continu continuing to promote our training workshops targeted to different governmental authorities and in collaboration with other organizations of the regional community. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the need for improved measurement uh, of and um, identifying uh, DNS abuse and continue your, your great work in workshops and trainings. Uh, Jia Rong. Thank you. Um, just quickly responding also to Ganesh. Uh, from ICANN, what we try to do is we do a lot of capacity building work, not on the regulation side, but with the operators. So uh, um, I'll reach out to you after this, and if you need any help, from the operators, we help them to think about DNS security. We also do capacity building for law enforcement agencies. Um, and it applies for, I look after the Asia Pacific region, so it applies for the Asia Pacific region I'm looking after. But we also have colleagues from other regions who do the same thing. And um, I thought the uh, uh, insightful remark, and I thought to close on this one, is um, the, the remark from Andrew is like, you know, is our new DNS standards uh, introducing new gaps? And actually, in our space for the DNS, I find as industry and also for us from ICANN and the IATF, we are very cautious, I feel. One example, um, we introduced DNSSEC, and a lot of people say DNSSEC doesn't really work, you know, it's not a great thing, solves only one small problem and so on. But there's this new other problem, TLS. TLS has a certificate vulnerability, and then uh, people introduce Dane. And Dane relies on DNSSEC which then is building on established standards that then continues to make sure that you go in a safe, secure, and resilient manner. And I think as a, as a, as a group, all of us thinking about DNS, that's probably the approach we want to go for. Instead of DNS, kill everything, or start, start over. 
But what we have is sitting on something very solid. And let's all work together to make that better, one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jen. I, I want to kind of carry on from what Jerome just mentioned about the capacity uh, gap that uh, our question from Nepal came from. Um, Dot Asia also proactively does in engage in a lot of capacity building projects around Asia Pacific region w in partnership with ICANN and KISA and other Asia Pacific and Google, and Google um, and organizations. And I think that is one of the gaps that we can also identify and, and, and really take action. Maybe as you know, DC DNSI, that's one of the actions we can take. Joining the dots in the kind of different approaches we're already taking, both contractual ones, both proactive ones, and things that can actually work. Taking the ones that actually work and scaling it and actually seeing if they would also replicate and work in other regions and other registry operators and other parts of the DNS ecosystem. And then and finally, I mean, I guess this is really important, but I think it's, it bears repeating. Uh, DNS security likes collaboration. We really need actual multi-stakeholder uh, approach to it. Uh, not just, you know, what Fiona mentioned before, hey, you know, the government's coming out and it's, you know, for consultations and we kind of take it in. That's not perhaps uh, an actual multi-stakeholder collaboration. We really need to bring in all the different elements in the DNS ecosystem and in, in, in wider as well to address this. So it's, it's more, more of a complete uh, approach. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so Keith, some, some closing reflections for you in minus 30 seconds, but yep. thank you. <laughs> Th thanks very much, Emily. Just uh, two quick points. I want to build on something that Mark Datiskeld said, um, you know, and uh, a, a concern that Esteban uh, raised earlier about the, the, the GTLD registries and registrars, ICANN's contracted parties, voluntarily uh, initiated this contract negotiation with ICANN to take on essentially a, an affirmative and enforceable obligation to act to mitigate DNS abuse within our areas of uh, you know, role, responsibility, and capabilities. It was, a, it was a bilateral initiative initiated by the contracted parties, registries and registrars, to take on new, act, uh, new obligations on ourselves. That was the first step, as, Mar as Mark noted. The, the second step, and registries and registrars in the ICANN space are committed to the multi-stakeholder engagement, committed to PDPs, policy development processes, through our GNSO as the mechanism for multi-stakeholder, community-based, bottom-up consensus policy development. And so the expectation is that will be the next step, which will then further address some of the issues that Esteban uh, you know, mentioned uh, as perhaps being undefined or less clear. So there's more work to be done. Um, to answer the question about what's next, uh, there's clearly a need for ongoing conversation and dialogue collaboration and information sharing. And I see it's two sides of the same coin. One is to bring all of the actors together. And I think to Michaela's point earlier, it's, you know, it, it could be, you know, there's concerns about IP blocking, right? The smishing, you know, the telcos, there's a range of actors that really ought to be part of this multi-stakeholder conversation, especially from industry as a starting point, as an initiated sort of conversation. Um, and I think that we should use the IGF construct. We should use the DC DNSI. Uh, we should use the national and regional IGFs to, in an organic, bottom-up way, um, sort of like start this conversation in different regions and different areas, and eventually work towards, um, you know, something a little bit more concrete in terms of identifying potential outputs. So I would say, stay tuned. Uh, there are conversations going on right now with industry associations and others and various operators at different levels of this ecosystem that I think have recognized this as a challenge and a need and an opportunity. So stay tuned. More to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, uh, for your participation today. Uh, we ran out of time, but I think that there's some, some really good thoughts for talking among the ecosystem inclusive conversations with the Global South, a sustained conversation, and maybe the, the IGF and the DNS um, uh, Dynamic Coalition can play a role there. We had lots of plans for, for giving that a spot, didn't happen, but uh, stay tuned. Thank you for your involvement. Thank you for your questions. And please join me in thanking our amazing panel for sharing their insights. <laughs>